Let's just continue in prayer. Father, we, we lift our hearts up to you. We acknowledge that's, that's what you're wanting this morning. That's what the Father is seeking this morning. Worshippers. Not just worshipping with our lips when our hearts are far from you, but worshippers. Uh, broken, yes. Flawed, yes. But we come to you resting in your grace and we acknowledge you are God and there is none like you and you are the one we need above all else. And so we find our refuge in you. We find our sanctuary in you. We find our safety in you. We find our satisfaction in you. And we gather together as your people this morning we declare that you are God. We lift up our hearts' praise to you as a people today. Father, be exalted in this place over us today. Let this be a place where you reign, and where your glory is displayed, and where your people delight in you today. As we get ready to open the word of God, just take these moments now, church. What is it that you're needing to hear from the Father? What is it that you're needing to hear from his word today? Just take these moments of quietness. Are you aware of some things that you're just saying, God, I need to hear from you? Father, we, we ask you to speak into our hearts and lives today. We thank you that as we open up your word, this is living and breathing, inspired of the Holy Spirit, and you speak to us today. And so we submit to you, and we submit to your word, and we ask you to speak into our lives in these moments. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Happy New Year for those of you I haven't seen yet in 2021. Uh, for those of you who have been on break, I hope you've had a lovely restful time. Uh, Sarah and I certainly had a, a really good break and it's lovely to be back with you. Let's just, um, uh, let me share some of the things that are coming up for this term. I uh, feel a little bit like a, a waiter who's sharing some of the set menu. You know, it's not like you get a choice in what you get fed here. It's a bit of a, a set menu. Sarah and I have been to a lovely restaurant in the Swan Valley a couple of times in the last couple of months. We've had the same waitress both times. And uh, the set menu, very, very good. Uh, you can ask me which um, restaurant that is later on. But I do feel a bit like that this morning. What, what's our menu for today? As we, as we start to look towards Term 1, what are we going to be looking at uh, in the Word of God? Well, today, uh, something very important, which will make more sense in a moment's time. Um, next Sunday will be Pastor Aaron's uh, final message, and you'll hear some more about that at the end of the service this morning. So you want to come along for that, the, the last weekend in January. School starts after that. Yeah, is that parents look like you're quite relieved at that prospect. Uh, kids, not so much. But school will start after, after next weekend, and so... February the 7th, we're going to have our ministry launch Sunday and I want to bring a leadership message which I pray will orient us for the year ahead as a church and I pray will inspire us for the year ahead as a church. And then we get into term one. And so it's quite a short term, this term. So from the 14th of Feb to the 28th of March, just seven Sundays for term one. And that will lead right up to Easter. So Easter will be Good Friday, the 2nd of April, and uh, then Easter Sunday on the 4th of April. So we've got this Term 1 series uh, for seven weeks leading up to Easter. It's been my pattern and rhythm over a number of years now to uh, make sure that I'm giving you a balanced diet uh, spiritually, scripturally, from the Word of God, is that I'll, I'll cover an epistle in Term 1. Go to a gospel or a 
section of gospel in term two, something from the Old Testament in term three, pick up a topic in term four and then get into Advent. And I sort of use that rhythm. Uh, but term one is epistle. And last year this time, seems like a long time ago, does it not? Last year this time, we got started in the letter of Ephesians. A magnificent letter from the Apostle Paul. A, a generic letter. But uh, the big theme in that first section uh, was seated. Christ has been seated at the right hand of the Father and those of us who believed in him have been seated with him, in him, in the heavenly places. The, the first big theme of that first section in Ephesians is, um, is seated. And so we're going to continue on uh, looking at the second section in Ephesians chapter 4 through to halfway through 5. And the theme moves from being seated in the heavenlies to now the nitty-gritty of how do you walk on earth? How do you go about practically following Jesus on the earth? But there was one passage that we didn't get to look at last year in that first section. We had to pause before we got to it. And that's what I want to pick up with you this morning. Ephesians chapter 2 11 to 22. So if you've got your Bible, you can get that ready. We'll read it together in a moment's time. So I want to look at this before we get ready for the Ephesians series for the rest of this year. But do not think that this is just a mere filler. Okay? A little bit of Turkish bread and dips before the real main menu. Okay? <laughs> not, not a chance. I, I actually don't know that we could be looking at a more timely... Uh, relevant, potent passage of Scripture to our cultural moment than this passage. Honestly. And let me give you a little bit of a, a setting up, a little bit of a framework to, to show why I speak it up like that, about how relevant this passage is for our cultural moment. So just to give context, just to help us see uh, the importance of this. Think of the last 100 years. And in particular, think of the kind of uh, ethnic rivalries, conflicts, hostilities that we have witnessed in the last 100 years. 100 years ago, 1921, uh, World War I had just ended on the 11th of November, 1918. Around 20 million people died. Then 1919 to 1920, there was a Russian uh, civil war. Uh, there was about half a million people killed or deported in what amounted to ethnic cleansing. There was an Armenian genocide during and after World War I. There was around 1.5 million people killed then. Then 1920 to 21, there was a Greek genocide in conflict between Greece and Turkey, around 450 to 750,000 people died there. 1930s, there was a war between Japan and China, millions of Chinese killed. Um, and then there was Joseph Stalin. Uh, he perpetrated ethnic cleansing of somewhere between 2.5 to 8 million Ukrainians. 2.5 to 8 million Ukrainians. And that's not even World War II yet. Then you get into World War II, you get Nazi Germany. Uh, World War II, there was around 75 million people died in World War II. Uh, Nazi Germany under Hitler sees 6 million Jews exterminated in mass genocides, noticing a, a pattern that's beginning to emerge across the globe here. 1947 to 49, there was a Palestine war. And I'm skipping lots here. I'm just picking up some of the biggies. There was apartheid. In South Africa, in 1948, where an all-white government uh, had policies to legislate racial segregation. That ended around 1993. There was a Berlin Wall that was built in 1961 to divide East from West Germany. Only knocked down 1989. Do you remember that? Um, 1966, the white Australian policy that had been in place since 1901 started to get demolished. 1967, there was a Nigerian civil war. Uh, 1968, Martin Luther King, a Baptist pastor, a civil rights activist, was executed. There was the Vietnam War, 
between the 60s to, to mid 70s. Then there was the, the genocide in Cambodia under Pol Pot and uh, the communist uh, government there. There was Gaddafi in 1970 in Libya. There was Saddam Hussein in the 1980s in Iraq. There's been ethnic cleansing um, in Croatia, Bosnia, Rwanda, Kosovo, Burma, My uh, Myanmar. 2001, it's going to be 20 years this year. 20 years since 9-11. How about that? Uh, there's been wars in the Middle East, Syrian refugees, uh, Sudanese conflicts, 2020 Black Lives Matter protests. A and I've skipped a heap in that. This is just a cursory brief overview of the last 100 years. What a century. What a century. <laughs> what, do you, what do you conclude when you look at that? I, and I've missed a heap. I've missed Protestant versus Catholic. I've missed North versus South. I've missed left versus right. Uh, I've missed a whole heap of other conflicts. But what do you conclude when you just look at this? The human race does not play nicely together. There is an incredible disposition in us that just has an ethnic rivalry that erupts in hostilities. In fact, I found a YouTube clip that was put together by a guy who gleaned all of the uh, wars that have occurred just from Wikipedia. He concluded there were 10,624 uh, battles. And he, he put all of those battles represented by a dot onto a, a world globe set to music by Hans Zimmer. And uh, as it went through the centuries... Over 10,500 battles, it just escalated in the last century. The last century was the bloodiest century on record in human history. What does that say about us as a human race? What is it about us that we so naturally uh, form into these us versus them polarizations? You look different to us, you sound different to us, you do things different to us. And so we're going to work out some way to oppose you and, and, and them, us. And it's us and them and it's them and us. And it just ravages our human planet. And it's erupted in these battles. Friends, does the gospel say anything to this human condition? Our propensity to demonize other people, to denigrate other people? Does the gospel say anything to this aspect of our human condition and our globe over the last hundred years? Or are we just all drinking some elixir, some mind-numbing elixir, you know, hiding away in little tucked away chapels because we can't handle the harsh realities of life? Is that what this is? Is that what church is? And, and out of the way, get out of the mainstream. It's so difficult. Let's just, let's just pep each other up with sugar water so we feel okay. And I want to say no. The gospel is the most potent message that declares an antidote to this uh, root cause in our human condition. And the church is not meant to be on the margin of this. The church is meant to be at the center of this ethnic diversity, this ethnic um, a rivalry and hostility. And the passage that we look at this morning just brings that out in such sharp relief. Do you know the Jesus movement is the most diverse an embracing ethnic movement in the history of the human race. So we've got something that speaks to this. And the Apostle Paul addresses it in this letter in Ephesians. He gets right to the heart of it. We have something to say, friends. We have something to display 
because Jesus has something to say. The, the gospel speaks to this, and so the church needs to speak to this. And so we're going to look at this passage this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Let me give you a little bit of context before we read it, because it's been a while since we've picked up this passage. I just want to set the context so that you remember where we've come from. Ephesians, this um, generic letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to that uh, main port city in what is now Turkey, uh, then minor Asia in, in his day. He had an incredible, significant ministry there. He writes to that uh, church there, that collection of house churches, but it seems like it was a circular letter. Uh, many people say that Ephesians is the, the crown of Paul's theology. The section we're up to today is the jewel in the crown. And so Paul started off with this cascading, tumbling outburst of praise, 202 words long in the original, without a full stop. He just lets rip with a song of praise, blessing God because of how God has blessed us. And then he turns it into prayer and he says, and, and I pray that you would know God. Know God, that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, that you'll know him, and there'll be all these blessings that come from knowing God. Then he gets sort of um, caught up in a magnificent digression about the supremacy of the power of Jesus. And, and then he moves into chapter 2, and he talks about the way that that power and the power of God's grace has been displayed in our lives in bringing us from death to life. He talks about our personal salvation and the way that we went from a position that was doomed and, and dominated and dead. And that by the grace of God, we've now been made alive and raised and seated. And so by this point in the epistle, you'd be forgiven for asking the question, is Christianity just a privatized individual affair? Is it just Jesus and you, you know? And, and that's all that we really foster on and, and, and foster and, and focus upon. Or is there something that Jesus has done that actually brings a cohesion and, and a, an integrated transformation? Is the gospel just about making you different and me different and giving us a nice individual private relationship? And we just happened to bump together on a Sunday morning, you know, like bumper cars at the show. Basically disconnected, but got a great connection to the power source and just bump on away like we do on a Sunday morning. Is that what the church is? Is that what the gospel is? Or is there something that God has done collectively? And so we get to this passage. Look at the way that Paul describes what's occurred here. Let's read it. I'll pop it up on the screen. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is just made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity. ESV says man, it's just anthropos in the Greek. One new humanity in place of the two, so making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him... We both, Jews and Gentiles, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, 
but you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now there's a, there's a wonderful sense of symmetry in this passage in a couple of ways. One is there's a symmetry of what's just gone before in verses 1 to 10, where he talked about our personal salvation, that we're in a terrible situation, but God and then a transformed position. And there's a similar pattern here now talking about us communally, that there's a terrible situation, there's a but now, something's happened in Christ, and then there's a radical transformation, but it's communal. And there's a wonderful symmetry in the way he shows the before and after. Here's a way of putting it. So he'll talk about our old position at one time and he'll outline six elements to our old position. He'll then focus on Christ, the peacemaker, but now something happened when Jesus broke in on planet Earth 2,000 years ago that has rocked the fabric of our world. And it's going to focus on his person, his work, his word. And then it shows the flip side. It shows the um, consequently, the NIV NIV says, or um, so then. And he'll, with typical symmetry, there were six elements of our old condition, now there'll be six elements of our new condition. And he's particularly focusing in on, zeroing in on, one of the key ethnic rivalries and conflicts that occurred in Paul's time. It wasn't the only ethnic rivalry, to be sure. Would have been heaps of other groups fighting each other all over the planet, as is typical of the human race. But the focus here, from a spiritual perspective, from the biblical story, the most important ethnic rivalry was the rivalry between Jews and non-Jews. And that's the one that Paul focuses in on here because it has the, the, the germ, the, the seed in it for transformation of all the conflicts in our world. So you ready to go? We're just going to race through this briefly and now I'm going to try to bring out some of the applications that flow from this. Ready? I'll take that silence as an unequivocal yes. Go for it, Pastor Paul. Okay, the first one is, remember you who were called uncircumcised by those who were called circumcised. Uh, This is a derogatory label with an overtly sexualized... um, feel to it this is this is a racial slur that the jewish folk would use against non-jewish nations uncircumcised um quite rude if you translate it literally from the greek kids are in i won't but uh this was a label that was thrown around like mud from jewish people to non-jewish people jews the only ones that ever do that a, a Jewish people at that time, were they the only nation and have been the only nation that ever used uh, slang terms to have a go at other ethnic groups? Huh? I remember growing up in the Great Southern, and I say this to my shame, this little group of white boys, we had slang labels for every ethnic group that looked different to us. I say this to my shame. I am not proud of this. We had slang labels that would dehumanize and denigrate every other ethnic group that looked different. If they came from Italy, if they came from Greece, if they were from Yugoslavia, if they were of Asian descent, if they were local indigenous tribe. And somehow, us white boys thought we were better, even though we could have traced our ancestry back to some common thief who was brought out to Australia courtesy of you know, uh, the queen, for some petty crime, but we thought we were better. And so we would disseminate this sort of language, you know. Paul's picking up on this. This was something that was happening among Jews and Gentiles, that there's a, a group of people who were privileged, but who used their privilege 
to disadvantage others instead of advantage them. And, and worse, I think of this in my own upbringing, I don't know that my views were ever challenged by Scripture and by regular Sunday school attendance. They may have been, and I just never heard it. But I tell you what, that sort of um, ethnic rivalry and hostility is one thing. You get it reinforced and justified spiritually and biblically, that's a whole new level of dangerous. Do you hear what I'm saying? When we feel that we are spiritually justified to oppose other ethnic groups. That's what Paul's picking up on here in this passage. And he just goes through this old position. He's writing to Gentiles. He's saying you were called uncircumcised. You were the victims of that sort of slang language. He says you were separated from Christ. Um, the Jewish people had a hope for a Messiah who was going to come to this planet. That's what Christos means, the Messiah, an anointed king who would come and bring God's rule. And yet he's saying, you Gentiles, you are separated from that Messiah because the Messiah was going to come from Abraham's seed, from the tribe of Judah. Uh, he was, he was going to be a, a descendant of King David. And you were separated from that. You didn't have a Messiah in your own ethnic group. The Messiah for the, uh, was from the Jewish stock. You were separated from Messiah. You were alienated from the commonwealth. You, you weren't a citizen. You were separated from that. You, you didn't have the rights of citizenship. You were always uh, treated as an outsider. You, you were strangers to the covenant of promise, that God had given all of these covenants of promise to the Jewish people. Now, he gave those covenants to bless the nations, but the Jewish people didn't do that. Instead of being a light to the nations... Instead of being a kingdom of priests to bless other nations, they did what is the default in our human condition. We get blessed, we get privileged, and what do we do? We use it to make ourselves feel superior. And we denigrate others and we disadvantage others. Instead of, bl instead of sharing God's blessing, we hoard God's blessing and say, I'm better. We're the us and you're the them. And so the people of Israel were strangers to this uh, rich heritage of the, the covenants that God was going to work out in their lives as a nation and through their lives to the nations of the world. He says you were without hope. When you started to count down how many days before your, um, your death, there was no sense of hope beyond the grave. You did not have any assurance that there could be an afterlife where there's something wonderful, no hope. And he finishes it off with, and without God. You had little g-gods, but you did not have connection to the God who created heaven and earth. He'd revealed himself to Israel, intended to be through Israel, but it wasn't happening. And so here's this uh, group of people, every non-Jewish nation. This was our condition. Is there any hope? And so Paul focuses in. He says, yes, Christ, our peacemaker. But now in Christ, what has happened? Verses um, 13, now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's a summary statement. Verse 14, he says, it's Christ's person. He himself is our peace. He doesn't just uh, work it. He doesn't just speak it. He embodies it. Jesus is our peace. He's the Prince of Peace. Our peace is going to be found globally in Jesus. He is our peace who's made us both one. And, and then he goes on to talk about his work. And he talks about his work in two ways. He'll talk about what Jesus demolishes first. And then after he's done the demolition, he'll talk about what Jesus constructs as he deals with this problem of ethnic rivalry and hostility. So his person, Jesus, is the peace. Now his work, what has he done? Well, he's done two things. Look at verse 14. He has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. What is that? Well, most commentators believe it refers to this. Let me show you a picture. This is a, a uh, diagram of uh, the temple that would have been in place at Jesus' time. Uh, built by Solomon and then reconstructed and given a real refurbishing under King Herod. 
you can see the big, if I come back here, can you still see it? You can see the big court, right, around, uh, around that central building. That big court was called the Court of the Gentiles. And so Gentiles could come and worship if they became a proselyte. They could come and worship, but they were barred. There was a barricade around that. And then women could get in a little way, and then um, men could go in further, priests could go in further, and only the high priest could go right into the centre. And so Gentiles could come, but there was a barricade around that central building, and it had an inscription. They found it. Archaeologic, archaeologists have found an inscription on that uh, meteorite high limestone barricade around the central buildings. This is what it says. No foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. That's not just trespassers will be prosecuted. It's trespassers will be executed. You know, this was under threat of death. Don't cross the barrier. Bang, bang. Or slit, slit, or however they did it back then. So when Paul is saying here that Jesus broke down the dividing wall of hostility, it sounds like he's referring to the fact that Jesus just went on a demolition and he just tore that barricade around, metaphorically speaking. And then it says the next phrase, verse uh, 15, it's, there's another negative work that Jesus does in his work by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Now, I'll, I'll show you a video clip from, um, from the beloved uh, Bible project that I think really explains this well. Uh, Alan, can you do it for me? Or I can do it. I can do it. Cool. All right. There you go. Let's watch this. Now, in chapter 2, Paul goes back and he elaborates on some key ideas from the poem in chapter 1, especially God's grace and this new multi-ethnic family of Jesus. He begins by retelling the story of how these non-Jewish Christians came to know Jesus. Before hearing about Jesus, they were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. They were trapped in a purposeless life of selfishness and sin, and they were deceived by dark spiritual forces of evil. But amazingly, God, in his great love and mercy, he saved them, he forgave all of their sins, and he joined their lives to Jesus' resurrection life, and he's brought them back to life too. And so now, having been created as new human beings through Jesus, they have the joy of discovering all of the new calling and purposes and tasks that God has set before them. Not only have they been shown God's grace, they've also been invited into a new family. Before hearing about Jesus, these non-Jewish people, they were not just cut off from God, they were cut off from his covenant people, the family of Abraham. And for a really practical reason, the commands of the Sinai covenant, they formed like a boundary line around the family. They were like a barrier that kept most non-Jewish people away. But in Jesus, the laws of the Torah have been fulfilled and the barrier is removed the two ethnic groups have become, as Paul puts it, a new unified humanity that can live together in peace. Now in chapter 2, Paul goes back and he elaborates on some key... I've already seen that. Thank you, Kim. I got that the first time. Um, so that's that negative work that Jesus did, okay? He, uh, in his person, he embodies peace. In his work, he demolishes stuff that fueled the rivalry and the hostility. He broke down the dividing wall of hostility. He abolished these uh, ordinances and laws of command that made this segregation, this distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And then it talks about the positive work that he did. So it says in the middle of verse 15, if you've got your Bibles there, it says, after doing uh, the negative work, the, the deconstruction, he now does the constructive work. Middle of 15, it says, that he might create in himself one new humanity in the place of two that's what we need guys we need a reboot we need a reboot we need humanity 2.0 jesus did it at the cross he's created a new human race so you know when you get married the the officiating uh, celebrant will say uh, you're no longer two but one. Something similar is happening here. That Jesus has done something so radical, so potent, so cataclysmic, that instead of there being um, a whole heap of different groups, there's now 
one you humanity. And then he goes on, verse 16, and that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So he makes one new humanity, and through his work at the cross, he reconciles us not only together, but to God. So all the hostility now has been broken. So this is the work of Jesus. In his person, he embodies it. In his work, he's demolished uh, what fueled the hostility. He's created a new humanity, reconciled us to God. And then it says his word. And his word, he says that he came and preached peace to those of us who are far away and those who are near. This seems to be referring to the message of the gospel proclaimed by the apostles, proclaimed by the evangelists. There are terms of peace that have been proclaimed to all peoples across the globe. That's the work of Jesus. And so now Paul goes on to the next half of it. What's the difference? What does that produce? What's the radical transformation communally? And so he identifies six things. He says, firstly, we both have access now. Jews and Gentiles both have access. That word access is the language of uh, having the right to approach a royal dignitary. How do you get access to a royal dignitary? Well, Paul says, Paul uses that language. He says, you have the right of access to the king of kings and the lord of lords to the creator of heaven and earth he says you are now fellow citizens you're not strangers and and, and aliens people with no fixed address just sort of passing through you are fellow citizens you have the right now to be able to enter the land to enter the city you are citizens and you are members of god's household you're not second rate citizens anymore second class you are his adopted children and he does not discriminate between ethnicities he says you're my kids and i love you and then he sort of morphs the language into temple-like language he says you've been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So he's already hinted at the temple, the literal temple in the past. Jesus prophesied that that was going to get destroyed, and it did in AD 70. But the language sort of morphs now that we have become a living temple for the presence of God among us. We've been built on that foundation. We are growing into this temple, that this is where God resides among the church, and that we are being built into this dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Under construction, yes, there is no perfect church. We're under construction. We're being built in. So look at that radical transformation that Christ has accomplished at the cross to the most significant ethnic rivalry and hostility that there was in Paul's time. And that actually lies at the root for all ethnic rivalries and hostilities. That once we were, once we were alienated. Can you imagine uh, growing up in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia (laughs) and hearing stories of the God of Israel? Going, wow, that's the genuine God. That's the real God who created heaven and earth. Oh, I'd like to be part of that. And you could become a proselyte, but you'd always be at a distance. You'd always feel like you were second class. But now, in Christ, there can be an Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 who's gone to Israel to worship. The Holy Spirit does a wonderful job of bringing Philip right alongside him. He preaches the message of Jesus to that Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch says, I want in. Philip says, if you believe in Jesus, you can. And so there and then they get baptized, spring up, and he is conferred with equal status. Irrespective of his gender, he was a eunuch. Irrespective of his ethnicity, he was an Ethiopian. Now he is embraced as 
an equal partner in Christ. So let's land this. Let's apply this. What does this mean for us? What does this say to us in our cultural moment? The church, Christ's multi-ethnic community. I said it before, the Jesus movement is the most ethnically diverse and embracing religious movement in the history of the human world. So I want you to notice, who is it that has produced this reconciliation? Answer, Sunday school, Jesus, right? And what group is it that demonstrates the work of Jesus the church so to a world that is desperate for ethnic equality and integration and a sense of peace Jesus has something to say to that you know what he says he says here's my church This is what I produced. This is meant to be a living embodiment of reconciliation drawn from every nation and tongue and tribe. And so we have to ask the question, friends, are we living that out or are we opposing that? Are we working with Jesus' purpose here or are we working against it? Because you see, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus broke down dividing walls. Are we building walls and fences back up that Jesus has broken down? Oh, how dare we? The the gospel declares that Jesus has put to death hostilities. Are we fueling hostilities back up that he's put to death? God forbid that if any group on the planet ought to express the beauty of ethnic diversity, it is the church. And we need to work with that, not against that. The church is not meant to be a bastion of perpetuated ethnic rivalries and diversities, hostilities. It's meant to be a wonderful joining of that diversity. And so really practically... Let's ask ourselves uh, three questions. Firstly, our attitudes. What's my attitude? What's my attitude to other ethnic groups? Do I think I'm superior? Do I think I'm better? Do Do I draw an us versus them line? What's my attitude to others? And if there's some attitudes in me that uh, do not want to honour and acknowledge the value of other ethnic groups, we need to repent of that. We need to repent if there's attitudes that are wrong. Secondly, what about my words? Have I still got some words in my mental dictionary that are slang words against other people groups? I grew up with them. Can I tell you what I think the Bible says we should do? Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just preaching what the scriptures and the gospel declares. And I've got to bring it home. This is too important an issue not to bring home. If we have any words in our mental vocabulary that denigrate other ethnic communities, eradicate them. Rip them out and burn them. Because it's completely contrary to Jesus' work at the cross. And our actions... Am I embracing other ethnic groups or do I hold them at arm's length? I don't want to go talk with that person. They look different to me. They sound different to me. It'll be difficult. Yeah, it might be difficult. But are we embracing? Or is my friendship circle mono-ethnic? Friends, I don't think any one of us here could not feel challenged by this passage. Honestly. I think it it speaks to our human condition that we default to an us versus them. And so this passage tells us we have got to deal with the root of that. 
there needs to be repentance before God and repentance before others. Lord Jesus, if you intended to create one new humanity, then we want to express that, not violate that. I think every one of us here should feel the challenge of that, shouldn't we? I think the worst response to this passage would be to say, oh, that's not me. No, I'm, I'm, I'm cool, you know? If you've got a pulse, this passage should challenge us. So just do a simple test, put two fingers in the air, turn the other arm over and pop those two fingers down there. And if it goes, ba-dum, 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 this passage should challenge us. If it doesn't, you've got another problem and Jesus can fix that too, okay? <laughs> hmm. And that brings us right into communion. Because Jesus didn't come for the healthy, he came for the sick. He didn't come for the spiritually elite who think we have it all together. He came for the people who know that we're broken. He didn't come for just one group. He came for all groups. He came to heal the sickness in our soul and to heal the nations. And so the vision at the end of Revelation is that there is a group of people drawn from every tribe and nation look at this revelation 7 after this i looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb that's in chapter 7 when you get to chapter 21 it talks about the way that the nations bring their glory into the new jerusalem We're not squashed into a a bland sameness. We bring the richness of all our diversity into the new Jerusalem and we glorify the king together. Friends, as we come to communion, we're reminded that we stand at the foot of the cross. Friends, the foot of the cross is level. There is no first class, second class division at the foot of the cross. At the cross, we are reminded that every ethnic group was created in the image of God. Every ethnic group has fallen into sin and will experience brokenness. Every ethnic group has had redemption paid by the blood of Jesus. Every ethnic group can be indwelt and transformed by the Spirit and every ethnic group will be represented before the Lamb on that final day. And so we come to the cross. And we need this as much as anybody else does. And so I invite you. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Friends, take and eat. This is the body of Christ. It's broken. After supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood in the new covenant. Not an old covenant, a new covenant, which is poured out for many, not a few, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Friends, let's drink together and proclaim his death until he comes. Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, as the Lamb who has purchased a people for yourself from every nation and tongue and tribe, who has broken down walls of hostility 
has abolished those differentiating laws, who has made a new humanity. And so we ask for ourselves, Lord, forgive us where we've perpetuated ethnic rivalries, ethnic hostilities. We repent and we ask that we might be a living, breathing representation of the work of Jesus in our city, in our schools, in our workplaces, in this state. May we partner with other uh, churches as a living expression of this beautiful, reconciling work of Jesus to a watching world. In Jesus' name we pray.